Well, good morning, and again, thank you so much for everyone being here. Um, and thank you so much for Chris for supporting and for APPVA for co-sponsoring this with us. You're on their insurance build today, so please pay attention to that fire drill um, that Chris went through. But first and foremost, thank you so much for everyone giving up what is the most valuable resource we have to give, and that's your time uh, in being here. Uh, and today, uh, originally, even, I'll go into this a bit later, but even before I started really putting um, my back into uh, supporting the Royal Commission, my head was always thinking about the so what, what now, and what is needed um, if we do uh, are successful in a Royal Commission, how we can best support our people, and how we can best maximise what is this once in a lifetime opportunity. And then during the progress uh, of setting up this conference, things like the direct communications channel to the Attorney General opened up. Uh, so there's this huge opportunity for everyone to provide their direct uh, correspondence into the Attorney General. And I don't want to spend all of today talking about the terms of reference, um, because this is the best part of this cultural change that's needed concurrent to everything else, is that uh, veterans need to start representing themselves better, need to start taking responsibility better. Um, and that includes individual contributions towards the terms of reference on the Attorney General's website or any others, the DVAs, our own Voice of the Veteran one that they need to, um, as opposed to just talking about things and starting to take some action. But what I will run through now is, what we did is we opened up a, uh, via the Voice of the Veteran website, a um, consultation opportunity for people to come in and provide their contributions. And um, overnight we have one more, but I'm not updating these. So we've had 640 responses, and what I want to go through is just to provide some of the data that has accompanied that. Per our privacy policy, I'm not going to share with you everyone's um, uh, inputs, everyone's uh, actual word and summaries and their personal details, but uh, we'll be able to capture some key themes and I'll go into some general explanations of those later. But there's a lot of um, data that we specifically set up this form to best help us uh, think about those. So what, what now? And that's the theme for today I'm going to have is so what, what now? And up on the board here, because um, I love drawing things very badly, I have opportunities and threats slash risks. Everyone's probably done a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Okay, we, we haven't yet been able to establish what the structure is, form, fit and function, so we don't have strengths and weaknesses, but what we have is everyone in this room and online from their own ex-service organisations or experience should be able to bring their own strengths and weaknesses to this discussion today to better help us flesh out the opportunities and risks slash threats that we need to address or mitigate as potential outputs for today. So there's a summary, 640, uh, three quarters male, one quarter female, oh, wrong thing. That's where it's from, 37% Queensland, 25% New South Wales, I appreciate those colours, don't represent state of origin teams, I get it. Victoria, 16%, and that other small blue portion is Western Australia, but great to see we've had it from you know, every straight state and territory. We also asked them to define themselves, and as you can see there, 64.4% um, ex-serving. Oh, sorry, i go back to that. I can't go back, there we go. Key point to note there, we have had people, because they also then entered in when their uh, discharge date was, and we have dates ranging from 1965 uh, through to April 2021. Optional question we put in here. Has your mental health suffered as a result of your service? 415 responses, 70% of the responses saying yes. So what? We now currently have 415 people that have told us that they have had their mental health suffer as a part of their service. So we have an organisational responsibility to conduct follow-up to those people. Cool? And that's what I'm talking about, voice of a veteran. But obviously that's some great demographic. We even asked them further, these are optional questions. Have you experienced any of the following? Attempted suicide, contemplated suicide, admitted for mental health, diagnosed with mental health issues, struggled with mental health issues but self-manage, and no issues with mental health. Again, so what, what now? Part of the key part, and I'll go into later with Voice of Veteran, is we've been focusing so much on the, the suicide number. We all know um, that is the ultimate um, lag indicator of mental health decline. And again, we have some great data that we're starting to get here that is our responsibility to follow up these people with understanding and empathy to what their circumstances are. What area do you believe should be the greatest focus of the Royal Commission? This was a multiple choice. You could select multiple. Um, I don't think that there are a lot of surprises there. Department of Defence, DVA, ex-service organisations, and ADF transition process. Optional questions, members of ex-service organisations. A key point to note, went through the gruelling task of differentiating all the ex-service organisations and over 160 
Um, different organisations are represented in those responses, ranging from national, state, local, and all forms of associations. And this is the key point again. The submissions are still open, I believe, until the 21st of May. Um, so important for anyone who still has submissions to please now go direct to the Attorney General. Um, the whole point of us conducting this consultation through Voice of the Veteran was actually before you were able to go direct to the Attorney General, given the response we had from a large part of the veteran community that were unwilling to engage with DVA. And as I've said openly and honestly, it's not about us first them, it's about getting the maximum amount of information to the Attorney General's department to best inform this process. All right, what I'm going to go through now um, is this is all from the Attorney General's website. The first five questions just go through uh, demographic information to um, clarify who's providing the response. And then there are three questions, questions six, seven, and eight. Question six, discuss the proposed themes the Royal Commission will consider during its inquiry. And we've just broken this down into some of the key, again, summaries. Uh, and these are just summaries. But the overall response, um, sorry, a large number of the responses really went into granular detail trying to discuss specific issues that the Royal Commission should cover into. And then there were a lot more that wanted to take that step back and actually be less, less prescript in what we provide the Royal Commission requirements in terms of reference to do, so as we can potentially finally have that fresh set of eyes um, opinion and not have them go funneling only into these areas to maintain maximum flexibility for um, the Royal Commission to be able to see what it needs to do. But of particular note, some key terminology and points that came out. And when we're talking about systemic issues and analysis of the contributing risk factors relevant to defence and veteran death by suicide, the need to expand that behaviour, not being death by suicide, but even suicidal behaviour, mental health decline, and also not just discount any isolated incidents for the, for the, the um, expectation that they don't include a systemic that's a bit of a chicken or the egg, but it's important that that's been a key information conveyed and we're just relaying that to you today. The next part, the protective and rehabilitative factors for defence members and veterans who have attempted or contemplated suicide or have other lived experience of suicide. And the need to include families and also expand the definition of families to include support networks for those who don't have those immediate families. And also the requirement to include ongoing rec recording and review mechanisms as opposed to, again, just these lag indicators, particularly when we have people come forward representing suicidal ideation or suicidal behaviour, feeding back into a learning loop as opposed to saving it for reports. You know, the so what, what now, what activities and actions are we doing as a result of this information as opposed to simply capturing it in the um, health and wellness uh, report released each year. The engagement of defence members and veterans within Commonwealth, state and territory governments around support services, claims and entitlement, and the need to expand that to not just be government, but non-government. And this is one key phrase we're going to keep hammering on. The wobble, the whole of veteran life. Cradle to grave, all these conversations are coming through, we all know. The whole of veteran life. Um, it, it really is a life, it's not an employment, and we really need to focus on all those factors that come from every form of government agency and non-government agency to our families and our networks and ourselves. Which we have there. A lot of people have gone through and listed, you know, it needs to cover Department of Defence, it needs to cover DVA, it needs to cover ComSuper, it needs to cover ex-service organisations, it needs to cover the national health network. Because when a person turns up to a hospital who is attempted or is contemplating suicide, the current system doesn't know how to deal with them, specifically if they're a veteran. There are all these granular details we can go into. And I would encourage you, if you really want to go into specific granular detail, to get on there and provide your submission to the Attorney General. So if you've already done it with us, we're forwarding it straight through. We are not doing any editing. We're passing it straight on. To provide that detail um, or leave it to being as open as it can so they can go into that granular detail. This is all, again, about framing the terms of reference um, and whether we want to do it very broad to allow them to do that, but also include in that granular detail specific in, uh, issues that many of you in this room have lived experience. And I won't go into those here because there are so many of those and they need to come from you individually to the Attorney Generals, not through us or through us if you want us to help or through DVA if you want them to help. But it's just so much more important about focusing on that result and getting it through. The next question, other issues the Royal Commission should have regard to? There's some really key stuff in there, as in what it can draw its resources from, pay a particular focus towards in order to provide benchmark or comparison. Oh, maybe not. Stoppage. Oh. 
and again, just some generic stuff in changing the um, terminology from you know, suicidal acts or suicidal death to suicidal behaviour and mental health decline. And again, encompassing this wobble whole of veteran life. Another key consideration that's come out is a lot of discussions regarding whether there needs to be a timeline imposed of this. Um, again, some of them were very prescript, just wanting it to be beyond 2001, because that's been a common conversation in the media. And from what I believe, and I know that uh, Tracy and we'll go on to it later, there's, there will not be a likely timeline in placed on this unless it's determined by the Attorney General's Department themselves. But I'll let Tracy and talk about that more. How will the Royal Commission conduct its inquiry? This has probably been the biggest area that we've received the most um, very emotive responses and very direct responses. And I just want to break this down on the next slide into specific areas. The Royal Commission will not be required to inquire into matters that it's satisfied and have been dealt with by other inquiries, investigations, or, criminal or civil or criminal proceedings. Straight up, pretty much every single response was no. <laughs> it needs to be able to cover off into those. Um, and in other consultations I've had um, across uh, DVA and everything else, that's been a pretty unanimous pushback. Uh, would anyone else not agree with that? Sure. Um, Further, it will not be required to make findings of civil or criminal wrongdoing or findings about individual defence and veterans' deaths by suicide. Now, this is a key point, and it's actually just poorly articulated within terms of reference. And again, as I discussed this yesterday with the DVA um, and the team, uh, that's the key point whereby those defence members in here are best related to an administrative process, whereby during the investigation, if you believe that a uh, crime has occurred, then it should be passed over to the authorities. That's that key piece there. The Attorney General's Department will still have the powers and is still compelled to pass it over to the correct authorities. But given that they have the power similar to essentially the Burton Inquiry, where they can compel evidence and not abide by the full rules of evidence, then it's inappropriate for them to then go into their own individual criminal investigation and to pass it to the relevant authorities. The Royal Commission will be asked to focus on systemic issues, recognising that they will be informed by individual experiences and may need to make referrals to the appropriate authorities. And that's where those two paragraphs should be a bit better worded, and that's just a key wording piece that's been captured by many, many people. Um, and then any other issues? Oh, oh. Sorry, my slide is not depicting well. A key paragraph in here, and this has been on advice from a whole bunch of people, um, all with SCs and QCs, and Jackie Lambie's team has been doing a great part on this as well, including something within the terms of reference, just like a simple statement saying that they have the ability to expand their own terms of reference as required. Again, with the intent to really try and provide them with maximum flexibility uh, to be able to cover off on this. Again, we're going to go into a Q&A session after us, uh, Tracy Ann, who heads up the task force for DVA, um, to come and present their findings so far. But it's really key that um, we can have some very good conversations because potentially some of those conversations will help cue someone else to have some thought that they can then put in for a submission. But first and foremost, um, I would please ask people, if you have strong opinions on this, to put them down into paper and submit them. We're now approaching that point, and we'll go into it later, that we need to activate our community to start taking responsibility and taking their own and individual action to help shape these outcomes. And we all now, each and every one of us, uh, have the ability to do so. All right, that is it from us. I'm not going to jump into questions now. What I'm going to do is actually hand over to uh, Tracy Ann. Now, Tracy Ann is from uh, DVA. She was brought over to DVA um, on secondment and is specifically heading up the uh, task force tasked to provide the consultation with regards to these terms of reference. Um, so I thought we weren't doing things properly unless we had them come in and provide what DVA has been doing. And again, um, please watch and listen for those insights to see potentially how they compare. I was down in Canberra yesterday and there's a lot of common themes there. And the key theme overarching is we can go down a rabbit warren with every single one of these or we can try and keep it as broad and as flexible as possible and actually allow a proper third party element um, to do its task and provide us with the information that most of us probably already know is there, but do it in a way that provides us with the authority to then action it at the highest level of government. Cool? All right. Just getting my basic instructions on the uh, technology. Uh, thank you for having me here today. It's an honour to be here and to have the opportunity to hear from you all. As Heston said, I'm Tracy Ann Burns. My role is in Veterans Affairs, and I had recently been appointed to head up the Royal Commission Task Force within the organisation 
to help us prepare for how we respond to the Royal Commission. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to pay my respects to those who have served, are serving and their families. As you're aware, uh, DBA has been involved in the consultation and the Minister, uh, Prime Minister appointed uh, Minister Chester to lead that consultation not by way of defence, but by way of explanation. Uh, it is normal for the lead department to undertake consultation to ensure that the avenues to make that consultation wide are explored. And that is by way of promoting that the consultation is available. The uh, organisation obviously deals with a lot of our providers, academics, uh, the veteran community, we also uh, have a lot of uh, ex-service organisations and the people in this room. So through the existing networks, that is how the organisation reaches out to let people know that consultation is occurring. That said, after two weeks, uh, it became very clear that parts of the community were not willing to submit their feedback to DVA and uh, the Attorney General's department worked with us to establish an alternate pathway. So, uh, as you're aware, that is now in place. We've, between the two departments, uh, there are now over 1,200 uh, submissions that we've received, and uh, we expect that to grow exponentially, especially once Heston sends through his 600, because uh, <laughs> I don't believe that they counted in the AG's numbers as such. So, uh, interestingly, our themes these are some, uh, an extract, not all of them. They're quite broad, as you would expect, given the nature of the group and the breadth of people that are providing feedback on the themes, and they vary quite widely. Uh, we are hearing the same thing as Heston presented, and they do vary from the fact that the terms of reference should be very broad to the fact that they should be very narrow, uh, so that the Commission can achieve a goal. We've also heard that they should be less of a checklist and that it should be outcomes focused. So what is the Commission to achieve and deliver as opposed to what should it look like, look at in delivering that Royal Commission. We have heard the same thing around the whole of life view and the need to look at systemic issues and be explicit around that suicidal ideation uh, attempts. Uh, we've also heard a strong, it, it balances between a strong desire for accountability and to hold people accountable for decisions that have been made versus the need to focus on the future and what will prevent suicide going forward and the need to have a safe space for people to come forward with evidence and stories to enable that future to be possible. So, as Hester mentioned, uh, it's a resounding feedback that previous reviews and inquiries should be open to consideration and that the uh, inquiry should include families and intergenerational impacts and that that definition of families needs to be very broad. So not immediate families as in spouse and children, but uh, grandparents, extended families, and the impacts it has on them. The need to, for the commission or an organisation in some way to run alongside and ensure that the commission is identifying the resources needed to imp implement findings in an iterative way uh, has been coming up. And this is about the need to take action now. So there is a concern always that uh, with the Royal Commission that there's a long period of time before action can be taken. And the feedback is they want uh, action now and that findings are implemented in an iterative way, but that clear identification of the resources needed and funding to do that is identified as uh, Heston identified, uh, it wouldn't be a Royal Commission into Veterans 
and defence members without uh, defence and DVA coming up in the feedback. A lot of this is around uh, DVA's processes and practices, culture in defence, uh, the practices around and uh, culture around mental health when you're serving and whether it impacts your career, uh, your ability to be deployed, transition is a big issue in the feedback, medication, and the need to consider where veterans sit in the broader context of society and international uh, practices and benchmarks. There have been questions around the role of the National Commission uh, with respect to Dr Voss today. Uh, it, uh, there has been a bit of confusion around how the National Commission might operate when the Royal Commission is operating. So uh, that's a matter for government to decide. The government has stated the National Commission will have a future focus. Uh, so that's come up a lot in the feedback. And I'll just touch on timelines, as Heston said I would. The feedback has varied a lot around what time frame the Commission should look at, and that uh, may actually be a decision for the Royal Commission. However, there's been a difference between the need to look very back a long time to see how this has emerged versus going back a shorter period to make it more effective and more contemporary. So the views on that vary quite widely. The next steps uh, for us uh, for in this process, uh, all the feedback that's coming in gets sent directly to Attorney Generals. Uh, to be very clear, we don't filter it, we don't change it, it gets sent as it is. This has been a matter of concern for people. And what DVA is not involved in developing the terms of reference. That's a legal document developed by the Attorney General's Department and it's formally known as Letters Patent. Because it crosses uh, state and federal boundaries, they're called Joint Letters Patent uh, because this will run as a national commission nationally, I don't want to confuse issues here, sorry. Uh, and then the Prime Minister will make a recommendation to the Governor General, and that will include who the commissioners might be. And it, I say commissioners, it's unlikely to be one, and it's likely to be an odd number, so that if they disagree, there's a balance there. Just, uh, Heston asked just for a bit of a uh, rundown on the powers of a Royal Commission. The, and DVA's role in that in particular, the Royal Commission itself will be entirely independent of government, defence, DVA, any other organisation that might be affected. Uh, and it's established under its own Act of 1902. There are a range of formal hearings and the Royal Commission will decide itself on how those are conducted. They might be public private, open, closed, private sessions can offer families and veterans a chance to give evidence in a safe space. Uh, closed hearings can provide a way for people to provide evidence without being identified, uh, without their name being disclosed in final reports. So there are a range of ways this evidence can be provided. Um, they can summons witnesses to appear uh, and certainly as a department we can receive notices to provide uh, evidence or to produce. Uh, notices to give is more around uh, providing information and explanation and these can be quite significant. So the role of the task force will be to ensure that DVA provides all of the information we have uh, to the Commission in a timely manner and that we provide that assurance that everything we have has gone. One of the, given that it was budget week and uh, we're interested in veterans affairs and some of the feedback coming back uh, has been how will uh, DVA ensure service to veterans continues whilst this Royal Commission continues and the impact of the claims backlog uh, on the mental health of veterans. I just want to give a little bit of an overview of uh, what happened in the budget for veterans uh, for, as it relates to veterans affairs. The 
Current investment is $11.5 billion, uh, split across our health and wellbeing services, compensation and commemorations and war graves. This year saw, this budget saw a, the largest investment in Veterans Affairs for quite some time with additional funding over the next four years to support uh, the department in providing its services, additional wellbeing, suicide prevention. So the department will be receiving uh, support for additional staff to address the claims backlog uh, and to focus on providing that simpler and better, faster service to veterans. The detail of the budget and the measures that are included in this are available on uh, DVA's website if you are interested in what sits underneath this. There are an expansive number of measures and details, but as, as I said, just at the highest level, uh, the department is getting 300, just over 300 million for additional resourcing to try and support veterans and provide the services that are required. There are measures around veteran health care, wellbeing and support funding, continuing our provisional access to medical treatment which is access to medical treatment whilst you're waiting for uh, claims to be processed. And commemorations and war graves receive funding as well to continue the maintenance on war graves and our commemorations activities. There was also funding provided to support the Royal Commission Task Force to try and minimise the impact on our core services. With regards to suicide prevention, uh, 2.6 million to examine death by uh, suspected suicide, uh, attempted suicide and other events where we undertake analysis to see uh, what we knew, where the, where the veteran was in our system, if they're in our system and uh, undertake that analysis. And around $26 million for support for the commissions uh, to provide the evidence, records, prepare witnesses and deliver the information that's required. So obviously as a department our priority is to uh, continue to support the veterans through the timely support of claims and health services, continue with the provisional access, uh, delivering our wellbeing and support program and at one of the budget measures included uh, trialling a non-liability rehabilitation pilot. This is uh, similar, or similar, it's along the lines of the non-liability mental health care that we have, where you don't need to have a claim with us to access services. We'll be trialling a pilot around how veterans might get rehabilitation without needing a compensation claim with us. So, uh, that's our priority, supporting veterans, and there's the 24-7 support through open arms. We are mindful that a Royal Commission can uh, bring up a lot for our veterans and our families, and our aim is to ensure our services continue during this period. Uh, thank you. That's all from me. Uh, no, we'll stay for Q&A. Um, you, can, you can have a seat if you want. We'll get you out of the spotlight. Um, all right, I'd like to open it up to the floor for questions. Before I do, uh, I want to reinforce what Chris said. You know, everyone here has a story. Everyone has a journey. Most of these people in this room have online as well have trauma. You know, um, we've all sort of been there. And a large part about wanting to bring this group together is to first and foremost. Um, not glaze over that, but to acknowledge that. Uh, but to ask ourselves and collectively the question of, so what, what has that taught us? And what now, what can we do with that? Uh, with responsibility, not with entitlement. Uh, and the opportunities that are really presented by this and the need to get this once in a lifetime um, event correct. And after the morning tea break, we're gonna come together and really start to drill into those so what, what now questions to see how we can best support this process, maximize this process and our people uh, along the way. But what I want to do now is just open up to questions specific to anything people want to raise regarding 
the terms of reference. And again, caveat to that, I would encourage all to still, even if you have done a submission, um, potentially add to that after this um, and uh, support each other in doing that because I know some uh, are struggling to provide those submissions themselves. Cool, so by show of hands, any questions? Let's start with online. Yeah, Hesto. Hello. It's Frosty. It's Frost. Can you hear us? Yes, we're just trying to get you on the screen. Hey. Yeah. Okay, we're hey, going with hey. Joe. Sorry, mate. Oh, sorry. So that's me. Um, Hello, I hope my internet holds up for this. Um, my question is in relation to uh, veterans who are too triggered to actually write their submission. Um, I work as a psychologist, family member of vets, and also a vet myself. So um, I see a wide range of um, views into this. And I know many of my clients and family members are too triggered to actually write their submission. So my question is, how do they get their voice across? Yeah, great question, Joe. And uh, this was part of while we try to set up the process through Voice of the Veteran to get, get people to get on there and do it if they didn't want to go through DVA. But this has to come down to the veteran community. And I would love to say to you, if that you have someone um, or anyone comes across someone who is too triggered to engage in the formal processes, to please reach out to any veteran group or organisation that person may feel comfortable to. Uh, and we should all be able to help that person provide a submission. There's no um, SOP to who they need to go to. Everyone needs to be able to go to who they feel comfortable and safe to be able to do so. And I'm pretty confident that there wouldn't be anyone in this room who wouldn't volunteer to help someone do that. Anyone correct me if I'm wrong? No? Um, so, like specifically, tactically for you, Joe, if you have someone, please feel free to communicate with us and with everyone's approval here, I'll, I'll send it out to see if, um, or actually, we'll probably provide you with the list of people so that they can select someone that they might want to reach out to and we're more than happy to facilitate that. So many of my um, clients reach out to me, but I, can I write on their behalf? Uh, it's, oh, I mean, this is it. You provide the submission. It's not evidence going into the Royal Commission. It's submission to the terms of reference. And as long as you're writing in there that, they can, that you're writing it on behalf of them, absolutely. Okay. You yourself, as any general member of the public, can write your own um, input. But particularly if you say that it's from a, you don't have to name them by person, but name sort of their experience pathway, that would give it some better context. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Just just quick with that, Heston, Tracy Ann just wants to jump in. She's got Do a it. point to, um, to add to that. Sorry. Uh, anyone can provide anything on behalf of anyone. Okay. So we do have some of the feedback coming through is from peak bodies and uh, groups, organisations. So if you have feedback, it doesn't matter whether it's personal or representing others or uh, you gathered it from collective view, you can simply provide that. And if it doesn't fit the nature of the form online, you can email it through in your own format. Uh, so it's, you can represent that it comes from a number of people, um, but it, it doesn't matter how, uh, it, but you're certainly able to represent other people's views in providing that feedback. That's a good point. I forgot it before on the Attorney General's website. There are the um, web form categories, but there's also an email that you can just send your submission straight through to because I know a lot of people have drafted some hefty documents. Um, so I did forget to mention that. My apologies. Question. There was another question online. Yeah, one here has though. It's uh, Jason Frost. Can you guys hey, hear me? Hey, Jason. What's going on? Hey, good. Um, just to kind of add on that too, we're down in the regional areas in New South Wales. We're looking after the Riverina. We've got a couple of um, centres that we've set up here um, trying to get guys out of isolation and re-engage. The big areas that we've identified down here is the medical services. So we have a lot of guys that are discharging from defence and when they go to the GP, GP doesn't really know what to do with them. So most of the um, prescribing algorithms that people are kind of fronting up to is the SSRI algorithm and the um, getting onto the benzodiazepams and opiates. And a lot of the guys are suffering a lot of side effects from these medications and that's not really addressing the issues. 
Um, we've got a new, a lot of new therapies coming in from the US, Canada and Israel that are starting to get accepted here in Australia. And DVA has actually acknowledged a lot of these new therapies, which is great. But the problem we have is the education to the primary health networks and everyone else. So that's one of the big areas that we're looking at kind of stepping in. And I was wondering, has that been looked into from you guys too for that new stream of medications that are coming in? Again, other Five Eyes nations have been using these for years and it's only just now that we're kind of tapping into these new technologies. Good question. So keeping it generic, like the uh, the medical system absolutely needs to be looked at. And then even diving into that, mate, yesterday I was at DVA with Tracy Ann um, and that pretty much exact question was brought up. And my exact um, adding to that was with regards to the Five Eyes community where we have Five Eyes intelligence and there's also Five Eyes ways and means to best support our veterans. And the US is definitely leading the way in some of those alternative um, medications and therapies and treatments. Um, that has been covered in some submissions, but I definitely encourage you to put that in, mate, again, because it, it is a key specific part. Thanks, mate. We just got the last one from online from Michael Kruger, and then we'll go to the floor. Freddie. Sorry, just working out my technology. Um, hi, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. I'll even turn my video on. How does that sound? So, uh, look, in October last, or in October 2020, uh, the government announced that they would address the remaining recommendations from the Productivity Commission report uh, as part of their final response in this year's budget. However, on Tuesday, the government has now said they'll finalise any outstanding matters from the Productivity Commission report as part of the response to the Royal Commission once it's finalised. Now, that's it's already been 22 months and um, there's many recommendations that were made as part of that report. There's 44 from 69 recommendations not picked up by DVA. Um, are we able to provide any context on when those, when the minister may make a commitment to those other 44 recommendations? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I'm sure Tracy Ann can speak to that. Uh, I will just add that, that, good work. That was actually brought up yesterday and that was actually part of some of the considerations to people saying that things that had been captured in previous uh, inquiries or reports um, need to be included because many of those haven't been addressed. I probably don't really want to go down into the rabbit warren of discussing um, the government's response just because to keep it specific to this, but I'll let Tracy Ann have a chat. My answer isn't much more expansive than that. Uh, the response to the remaining recommendations is a matter for government, and I'm sorry that sounds like a bureaucratic answer. Um, however, the remaining recommendations uh, around the legislative and structural changes for the Productivity Commission. Uh, 11, 11 of the recommendations were responded to in budget uh, and they are leaving structural and legislative change to be responded to as part of the Royal Commission and that was a matter for government. Thanks, Freddie. Thank you. On the floor. Hey, mate. If you could just let us know who you are and where you came from. Hey mate, uh, Andy Cullen from PTSD Resurrected. Uh, my question is, uh, is in relation to the terms of reference but also in relation to uh, the presentation by Tracy Ann. I was encouraged to see quite a dramatic increase there with the budget for DVA because obviously there is a, a great need there. One of the areas we've been lacking in the past is support for uh, peer supported programs and when you're talking about this whole of veteran life topic, I think this is an area that needs to be addressed. And my question really is, has there been anything identified within that new budget where there's a clear pathway for other um, support um, things that are available to veterans? For example, things like uh, s programs addressing moral injury um, that are gonna be available for consideration for funding. Some of this stuff that has proven medical backing and, and that sort of thing at the yeah. moment that there hasn't seemed to be any clear funding pathway yep. or opportunity p to pursue that for government support. For sure. And Andy, I'm going to want you to grab that question and bring it up after morning tea um, because the whole discussion of the so what, what now and exactly things like that with the opportunities such as the budget, um, from my lived experience over the last six months, we can either wait for top down or we can build ground up policies and submit them for approval. Um, and that's one of the things that within this collective I want to try and do and allocate budget, budget and funding and have that go to people for submissions 
either through DVA or actually direct through the Department of Defense or direct through a senator to achieve exactly that. So, um, there, look, there's a lot more to come out specifically on the budget, but what I want to do is to start even start shaping the mindset after morning tea for this ground up approach because we all have the lived experience. And I don't know about you guys and girls, but a lot of my own issues uh, came from sitting there waiting for top down to know all the answers that come from our own assumed experience. And all that I've learned over the last six months is that we energize that and apply that in a very focused way and understand the bureaucratic and political systems. You know, there's money there and resources to be had. We just need to give them a reason and compel them um, to provide that funding and support that. So let's make that an output from today. Uh, John Lowers from Defence Force Welfare Association. Um, the focus of the Royal Commission and indeed the uh, National Commission uh, has been on the tragic tip of the iceberg, namely veteran suicide or attempted suicide, and rightly so. However, beneath the tip of the iceberg, there are thousands of veterans and their families living day to day with the impacts of service and uh, the unique nature of military service and what it has involved. There is homelessness, there is incarceration, there are family breakdowns, financial difficulties, the difficulties with transition, uh, uh, dealing with various bureaucracies and that sort of stuff, which can lead to an ongoing miserable life, just struggling. And of course, out of that, there are some who tragically take a final step. But with the terms of reference for the Royal Commission, there are a lot which seems to predicate that the start of a line of inquiry is on a suicide or an attempted suicide. We must not lose sight of the fact that there are other things going on where Suicide may not have been the uh, may, may not be the instigator, but there are things going on which causes the stress, which can lead to suicide, mm -hmm. and those things should not be ignored by the terms of reference, the letters patent, and they should be broad enough so that the commissioners can go and examine those things and not ignore them. Yep. Absolutely agree, John. I think you would have seen on the slide I brought up um, changing the. Um, suicidal deaths to suicidal behaviour and mental health decline and the inclusion of whole of veteran life, including family, including support. 100% um, with you. And that's really, I've said it 100 times over the last six months that uh, for every one person that's committed suicide, that we've lost to suicide. You know, there's another 10 who have attempted, another 50 who've contemplated, um, another 100 or 1,000 who are living with some form of mental health decline. And that is a whole raft of issues um, from personal and professional lives that we need to uh, better articulate. And I think it's also key to note, and a key point that was brought out by um, one of the people yesterday at a conference I attended, is that uh, just focusing specifically on investigating um, suicides and backtracking as to how they occurred uh, is one method of inquiry. So speaking to those who have engaged with uh, suicidal behaviour or attempts is another. But then also um, in the manner of actually grabbing those people who have successfully transitioned and have not had mental health issues and actually mapping out the pathways and the successful pathways in their lifetime and looking to compare the two different ways to potentially identify key markers that can be integrated across those. I mean, I'm not, that's diving into how things can conduct their investigation, but in particular, in potentially some of your responses after this, trying to put some more of those um, pragmatic and positive approaches because there's plenty in this room who have gone down and come back or who have never gone down themselves. And we need to capture that excellence um, as well as focusing on the systemic and critical issues. Any more questions from the floor? Okay, cool. I mean, we don't need to labour the point. Um, again, uh, as I said before, there's suggestion boxes in front of you if you want to write things down or put them in. Throughout this, you can also email through. We've got the team at the back, hello at voiceofveteran.org. I would again, just particularly to, with, with regards to terms of reference, please get on there uh, and provide your own submission before the 21st uh, of this month if you have not already. Please encourage as many other people who will happily have a beer and chest poke you about these things um, that they're not allowed to do so unless they put their own submission in. Um, now is the time to sort of uh, take control and help support that.